And welcome back to the next and final Set in Stone episode of Math for Game Dev, the series in which we cover topics in math that are just mwah, multiple bene, eh? Huh? This episode was going to be about probability and fuzzy logic, but now it's just about fuzzy logic. I was writing out the original script and I realized that, yeah, probability is a theoretical motivation behind fuzzy logic, but aside from motivation, I don't think it's core enough that we have to cover it. I will say, I think that being able to think probabilistically is one of the best skills you can have in life. It helps you assess risk and return and how to consider things that may happen infrequently, if at all. And I hope that even though I won't be covering it in this series, you'll take it upon yourselves to develop a basic familiarity with it. Enough of the dawdling. Fuzzy logic is a system of logic where the truth values of variables are uncertain instead of strictly true or false. For those of you interested in going deep on fuzzy logic, I recommend Matt Buckland's Programming Game AI by example. The 10th chapter focuses on fuzzy logic, but overall it's a great learning resource. It's available on Amazon for like 50 bucks, but if you look elsewhere, you can find it for much less if you catch my drift. All right, this episode we'll be implementing a a fuzzy logic system to create guard AI similar to what we see in Hitman here. We'll be using fuzzy logic to affect both the vision, so that way it's fairer and has more verisimilitude, and also the guard's behavior itself. But first, Boolean logic. Since the artists left after the linear algebra episode, I'm going to assume that most of you watching have a basic familiarity with programming, so I'll cover this quickly. Boolean logic, or Boolean algebra, is a formal way of reasoning about whether or not a conditional statement is true or false. It has three main operators, or, and, and not. The or of two boolean values is true if at least one of them are. The and of two bools is true if and only if both of them are. And the not of a boolean value is true if and only if the original bool is false. We can write all this out with the following truth tables. And with that simple introduction out of the way, let's get to the fuzz. Fuzzy logic is of course a way to perform something similar to Boolean logic, but with uncertain truth values. So instead of something being either 100% true or 100% false, things are instead kinda true or somewhat false. So instead of strict true or false values for our fuzzy logic variables, we're going to be using numbers from 0 to 1, with things that are absolutely false being a 0 and things that are absolutely true being a 1. Now just like with regular Boolean logic, we still need our three logical operators. I'll start with not because it's the easiest. Not is just one minus the original fuzzy value. If we roughly graph it out, as you can see, it'll take something that's absolutely true or one and make it absolutely false or zero and vice versa. And then in between is just this straight line. However, there are two ways to fuzz or and and. For or, we can either let or be the max of two fuzzy variables, or we can let or be the sum of the two original variables minus the product of them. And and can either be the minimum of two fuzzy variables, or it can be the product of them. I graphed all these out in Blender with contour lines so you can visually see the differences. Max and min have a clear fold in them, whereas the other definitions are smooth. However, we use these definitions because no matter how long the fuzzy statement gets, it will always remain between zero and one, meaning the result will also be a fuzzy variable. Just like how really big Boolean statements can always Always be reduced to just true or false. Now before we get on to our technical example today, there are a lot of ways I could implement AI, either with behavior trees, hierarchical task networks, Go, scripting and elbow grease, or something else entirely. It can be both a lot of fun and a lot of work to implement an AI system. So whatever works, works. Okay, on to Hitman. Let's say we're implementing a vision system for the guards in our stealth game. We want the vision to have key features to make the game feel better. We want guards' vision to drop off the farther away they are, and we want the player to be able to hide in both full and partial cover with different efficacy. And what we do not want is the player to be abruptly fully seen 
by the guards once some arbitrary threshold is passed. Now, like almost all stealth games, each of our guard NPCs will have a cone-ish collider that will be used for vision. And of course, once the player is inside the vision cone, the NPC will attempt to see the player character each frame. Now, let's make a statement for how we want vision to behave. When the player is close enough and in the open, the NPC can see the player character. So let's take that statement and fuzz it. We'll say that visibility is some combination of proximity and lack of obstruction. If I graphed visibility with respect to each individually, I'd get these two graphs. One where visibility decreases with distance and another where visibility decreases with obstruction. Of course, I just take the fuzzy and of these two by multiplying them and voila, I would find that visibility would be the product of proximity and one minus obstruction. Now we have to decide how exactly we're going to fuzz proximity and obstruction. And this is where we get to make personal decisions. For example, I could use some function to map the distance of the player character to zero through one. You could of course use linear interpolation or use an entire different function so that way the guards don't seem so myopic just as long as it turns the distance into some number between 0 and 1. Next, obstruction is a fun one and to keep it fun let's imagine our player character has a number of recast targets throughout the character body and an NPC will check if it can see the player character by casting a ray to each of those targets individually. The fuzzy value for obstruction could of course be 1 minus the percentage of the targets that were successfully raycasted to. Building on that, we could set specific weights for each target, so that way things like hands and feet don't really matter as much, which I think is fair and fun, but if the guard can see the player character's head or torso, then they can basically see the player character. Then you just take the product of those two, and we've fuzzed vision. Of course, Hitman is a game of social stealth where behavior matters, so let's imagine the game we're working on is in a similar vein. We'll let the guards query whatever the player is doing at any time and assign it a suspicion value, which just like everything else in fuzzy logic will be some number between 0 and 1. Completely safe actions will be a 0. This could be walking around in public areas, questionable actions will be something between 0 and 1. This might be trespassing in forbidden areas. And then completely forbidden actions will be a 1. Next, let's set up each guard to have some variable that tracks how alarmed it is. This is of course going to be some value between 0 and 1 as well. Of course we want our guards to become alarmed if they fully see you doing something suspicious, but stay relaxed if they don't see it. So we'll construct another statement for how each guard's alarm value behaves. Alarm value increases with visibility and action suspicion. And just like with vision, we just take the product of these two fuzzy values. Alarm is equal to vision times suspicion. This makes our guards go full alarm instantly when they see something very naughty. But for something that's only kinda wrong, that they can't really see well, they're just suspicious. And of course, we need our guards to relax over time instead of just chilling out right away or never chilling out at all. So at the end of each frame, let's have each guard subtract some constant multiplied by the time between the current frame and the previous one and cache that. Then at the start of the next frame, each guard will set its alarm value to the maximum of that cached value and what its newly calculated alarm value is, or using fuzzy terms, the OR of those two values. Let's continue fuzzing the guards. Say our guards are similar to Hitman's guards where they have three states, relaxed, suspicious, and alarmed. We can also use fuzzy logic to determine which state a guard should be in using their own individual alarm value. Of course, for an alarm value of 0, the guard should be relaxed, and for an alarm value of 1, the guard should be fully alarmed. But for something like 0.3, we might want our guard to be kind of relaxed and kind of suspicious. So we'll just make up some curves for each state that vary with respect to alarm. Wherever a guard should fully be in a single state, that curve 
should be a 1, but wherever a guard is transitioning from one state to another, the original state curve should be decreasing while the next state curve increases. I completely made these up, but I think it's what we would want. Then to determine which state the guard should be in, we just look and see which state curve is the greatest for whatever the current alarm value is. As an added bonus, if we use this system, it lets us create lazy guards and elite guards without much work. Our lazy guards will of course have wide state curves for the relaxed and suspicious states and a very narrow band for alarmed, whereas we can create elite guards by just doing the opposite. So that's it for fuzzy logic. It let us create a pretty robust set of rules for our guard behavior just using some basic ideas. Fuzzy logic is definitely one of those short and sweet topics you can come back to time and time again. Anyway, that's it for this episode, and for the time being, that's it for this Math for Game Dev series. I might release an episode now and then about a specific topic, but for all intents and purposes, this is the finish line. I hope you all enjoyed it. We covered a very wide set of topics in an inappropriately short amount of time, and while we definitely didn't fully cover each one since we were going that fast, I I hope that these videos are the jumping off points for further personal exploration. Math is a skill, and like any other, familiarity and mastery will develop the more you use it. We all make mistakes. I doubt I will ever stop making math mistakes, but over time, you will recover faster and faster from them. So go out there and use math. Thank you very much for watching. It may not show, but I put in a lot of work into this series and your time means a lot to me. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I release videos every two weeks. However, I'll be going back to just devlogs for the foreseeable future. So if you want to follow along with those, please subscribe. I will be more than happy to read any comment I get. I love them. I'm also on Twitter. Maybe I post, maybe I don't. Follow me at dev underscore Natsu to find out. But if I did post, I'd post what I bake there when I bake it. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. I return to focaccia and, um, you know, it's, I, I really like focaccia. It's a, it feels easier than sourdough. It might not be, but it feels easier. So it's kind of like, you know, it's like, ah, uh, I, I mean, I, I think it, I think it's, Time-wise, it's definitely like faster for me because I let my sourdough ferment for like 48 hours in the fridge, whereas focaccia, I just ferment it overnight. So, you know, if I don't plan well, if I plan poorly, I was like, oh crap, uh, I guess I'm doing focaccia. <laughs> but I mean, it's still, it's still delicious. And, you know, I use my sourdough starter for my focaccia as well. So, you know, you can just use it for anything basically. And I like it. It's got, it's, I think you can see I have rosemary. I might also have black pepper on this. I kind of forget. But I usually add black pepper and rosemary because I like the flavor of the black pepper when it gets baked. It's really good. I made two loaves and I did an experiment with these loaves. I tried leaving them covered the entire time. Hopefully, I was hoping they would poof up more. I don't really think it worked out, unfortunately. But they did. I mean, we'll hop to the cross section they did still pop up a bit and look at me using these uh profile pictures angle profile portrait portrait style pictures whatever the up and down instead of the left and right look at me using the up and down instead of the left and right i really should remember to just use the left and right because it works best for these videos but i mean you still got a nice beautiful crumb it's not really super crusty like the sourdough so sometimes you know sometimes you just want a nice soft bread and this is focaccia. And of course, it's got a bunch of olive oil. So it's delicious. It's flavorful. It's rich. And if you have like fresh mozzarella, basil, tomatoes, mortadella, other Italian deli meats, it feels on theme to use a focaccia. And, you know, we got I got fresh mozzarella and basil and tomatoes basically all the time. All the time. It's, uh, you know... I'm basically in tomatoes every day, honestly. <laughs> tomatoes, garlic, that's me. But so it's nice to just sometimes it's nice, you know, come back to focaccia. It's nice, easy, comfy bread. It's real tasty too. Real tasty. But anyways, I'm going to call it for today. The yeast in the air is free. You should go out there and bake. It's delicious. It's good for you. And it makes a great gift. Thank you for watching. And 
I hope you have a nice day and see you next time.